With disinformation swirling around on social media, we take a look at how it could impact the Latino vote this election. Plus, three prominent football players from NAU, ASU, and U Arizona speak out about using their platform to discuss social issues. And later this half hour, we break down how our mental health may be suffering in 2020. Cronkite News starts now. Good evening and welcome to Cronkite News on Arizona PBS. I'm Rasara Wardsworth. And I'm Tyler Mannion. Thank you for joining us. Following an uptick in reported COVID-19 cases, Governor Doug Ducey held a press conference at St. Mary's Food Bank today. Arizona Department of Health Services Director Dr. Kara Christ joined him to provide an update on the state's numbers. Her department reported 1,315 new cases and 13 additional deaths this morning. Ducey announced a new program to help those in Arizona struggling with food insecurity. The funding will, be, will enable food banks around the state to make more food home deliveries to seniors. It will also provide funding to the Double Up Food Bucks program, which doubles the value of SNAP benefits at farmers markets. As we press on in the fight against COVID-19, we're going to continue to invest in big ways to help Arizonans who need it most. The $1.6 million investment is designed to expand deliveries and make more products like meat and produce available across the state. We are just five days away from the presidential election, and both the Biden and Trump campaigns are crisscrossing the nation trying to sway undecided voters. The presidential candidates holding competing events in Tampa, Florida, just hours apart today. According to a new survey conducted here in Arizona, 80% of voters would prefer to have accurate election results as opposed to a winner on election night. The survey was conducted by the Tyson Group and was met with bipartisan support. The results showed 90% of Democrats and 67% of Republicans believe it's more important to make sure every vote is counted, even if it takes a few days to announce the winner. Due to the global pandemic, more people are voting by mail, which could result in slower processing times. There's no doubt disinformation is swirling around on social media, potentially manipulating this November election, as the, and the Latino vote is especially vulnerable. Cronkite News reporter Kylie Cochran shows us how disinformation targeting the Latino electorate can impact a battleground state like Arizona. Sharing false facts unknowingly through misinformation is problematic for democracy. But there's a subcategory that's intentionally malicious, disinformation. The purpose of disinformation is to change people's political reactions. Derek Bambauer is an internet law professor at the University of Arizona who studies the impact of disinformation on elections. Latinos are very likely to be swing voters. They could uh, easily decide the presidential election and um, the pending Senate elections in these states. And that means that they're both enormously valuable and also enormously attractive targets for misinformation or disinformation. One first-time Latino voter, Fernando Ruiz Martinez, remains in high spirits despite these information hurdles. I went and picked up my ballot from my mailbox and it was like, wow, this is so cool. Like, I don't know how to explain it, but it was like, it's finally here, you know. But disinformation is still getting through to the Latino electorate, which represents the largest group of minority voters at 32 million eligible citizens, according to Pew Research. One common form of suppression is creating confusion about safely voting by mail. I was on the phone with someone and they were afraid of uh, sending their ballot by mail instead of making them feel like scared about it. I told them vote early. Social media acts as an accelerator for disinformation, which means it spreads quickly here on Facebook, here on Twitter, here on WhatsApp, and here on TikTok. But social media can also be used as a force for good. Ruiz Martinez is volunteering with voting groups like Mi Familia Vota and One Arizona. She creates content targeted towards youth in her community with this goal in mind. Yeah, just make it easy for them 
to understand the political process and don't feel overwhelmed when they see their ballot. Bam Bauer believes minority voters can be disproportionately overwhelmed by the political process. They have an understandable and historic skepticism of some of the same institutions that we are directing them to consult or to place faith in as a way of uh, weeding out fake news from real news. That disinformation is hard to avoid online, some of which reflects the QAnon conspiracy theories about President Trump saving America from global elites who run child sex trafficking rings. So for Ruiz Martinez, getting her community the accurate information remains the priority. My focus here is to make sure that everyone in our, within my community, the Latinx community, which is a very important ethnic voting bloc in this election, they get the information that they need. Kylie Cochran, Cronkite News. Election day isn't just about November 3rd. Now is the time to vote early or drop off your ballot. For accurate election information, Contact your county recorder's office or visit azcleanelections.org. Right now, the state has more than 4.2 million active voters registered ahead of next week's election. Secretary of State Katie Hobbs says 388,000 Arizonans registered to vote since the quarterly update in January and 246,000 registered since the August update. Out of the active registered voters, 35% were Republicans. 32% were Democrats, and 31% were independent. Voter suppression is a nationwide issue that is likely to occur in every election. Anti-intimidation laws are in place to protect against voter interference. Reporter Faith Abercrombie talked to several different groups to learn how to prevent it and report it. Voter intimidation is a scare tactic used that leads to voter suppression. So at the federal level, there are a number of criminal prohibitions on voter intimidation. There's also civil provisions that allow people to be sued for intimidating voters. And then in Arizona specifically, there is a specific state law that makes it a misdemeanor to intimidate any person who for voting for a candidate, for refraining from voting, or to vote against another candidate. Sending threatening emails or campaigning within a polling location can lead to serious consequences. If anybody is intimidating voters or committing election fraud, the penalties are significant. Um, you're looking at a, a large fine or jail time. The state of Arizona requires a 75-foot perimeter around every voting location to avoid intimidation. Some activities that are prohibited include electioneering or carrying firearms or weapons of any sort. Your ballot selfies from home are okay, but any pictures or videos taken within the 75-foot distance can count as a misdemeanor. The poll workers are um, trained to uh, de-escalate the situation if they're able to. Um, like ask the people to leave, but then they have a designated troubleshooter that they would reach out to if they weren't able to defuse the situation on their own. A group called the Lincoln Project partnered with the Democracy Labs to create the initiative See Something, Say Something 2020. During the 2018 midterm election, about 1,133 voters reported a problem on election day, yielding about 623 valid reports. It's not an app. You don't have to download anything. If you just go to csay2020.com, there's a brief form to fill out. Uh, you can put your you should put your name, your contact information, and then what happened, and then any photo or video evidence you have of it. Um, it's really, really simple. We don't release people's names publicly. The only reason we track them is if we see something particularly egregious, we want to be able to follow up with whoever saw it. Every ballot cast is completely anonymous. Any signs of voter intimidation should always be reported immediately. Faith Abercrombie, Cronkite News. CSA 2020 is up and running for this year's election. You can also report any signs of voter interference to poll workers, county election officials, or law enforcement. A U.S. fighter jet intercepted an aircraft flying over President Trump's rally in Arizona yesterday. The F-16 flew over Bullhead City after a general aviation aircraft entered the temporary restricted airspace. NORAD says the violating plane did not initially respond to intercept procedures, but it established radio communications after the jet deployed signal flares. The smaller plane was then escorted out of the restricted area without incident. With the presidential election just around the corner, people all around the country are talking about the importance of voting. Cronkite News reporter Rachel Phillips looks at how Arizona football players are using their voice. 
the intersection of politics and sport has become increasingly prevalent over the past few years. Its most recent instance came last week when NAU linebacker Tristan Vance was spotlighted in a Biden ad. I trust Joe Biden to do that. Vance felt obligated to take the rare opportunity on a global scale and use his voice as both a black man and student athlete. Just being able to share the stories, I believe it's a form of um, education, it's a form of fight, providing insight and information um, to people who don't know. And uh, that's just my, uh, that's a first step, I believe, in like, you know, beginning to like bridge the gap. When athletes use their platform to talk about social justice or politics, it's often met with repercussions. But the Lumberjack recognised the significance of making a statement off the field and hopes his fellow athletes will do the same. It's not just about, you know, the, the backlash you could receive or, you know, you towing that line. It's you being able to be a voice for the thousands because not, all, not every voice can be heard. So if you have the opportunity, go ahead and share it. With the narrative on athletes speaking out gradually shifting, ASU quarterback Jaden Daniels knows the gravity his input can have. People might not see it. Sometimes take for granted what the student athlete says. So they see a lot of student athletes voicing their opinions and supporting each other. And then I feel like there's going to be there's going to be no reason but to force them to change. The change Daniels hopes to see: social injustice and police brutality. There's a lot of things that that are still getting let by when it's not okay. Um, just me being a, a African American world, you know, I feel like we should. Me and other student athletes are, are black and shouldn't be able, should, shouldn't be scared to walk outside with their hood on. Come Tuesday, Vance, Daniels and Arizona quarterback Grant Gunnell will be swapping this for this so that their voice is heard. And they're encouraging everyone else to do the same. You're voting on your future when you vote. So I feel like that's important for everyone to do, not just athletes, for students, for the community to vote. And, you know, you're deciding on what you want this country to be. The support Vance has received could be the start of athletes being viewed as more than just the number on their back. And for those who just want players to stick to sports... They um, devalue your life experiences beyond that field of play. I don't feel like that they're truly your fans. Vance isn't letting the change end with his vote. He recently helped start an organisation at NAU called Athletes for Social Alliance which offers professional support for the school's athletic community. In the Broadcast Centre, Rachel Phillips, Cronkite News. Coming up next on Cronkite News, Queen Palms are struggling with the hot summer temperatures here in Arizona. What you can do to help them survive the desert heat, next. This Month in Passport, your on-demand library of the best of PBS. Everyone has secrets. Are you protecting someone? I have no choice. You do have a choice. You're looking at him. That's amazing. We could be standing on top of a T-Rex right now. <laughs> Women demanded new space and pushed the boundaries of what being a lady means. These and other shows are available with Passport. Become a member of this PBS station, sign in, and start streaming today. I'm Judy Woodruff, anchor and managing editor of the PBS NewsHour. The journalists of tomorrow face a fast-changing media landscape, but quality news remains vitally important to our communities, our country, and our world. At ASU's Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication, students learn solid, reliable reporting, holding the powerful accountable, and rebuilding the public's trust. The Cronkite School and Arizona PBS preparing the next generation for a stronger future of journalism. Ready to watch the best of PBS anytime, anywhere, on nearly any device? It's easy with the free PBS video app. Simply download the PBS video app on your mobile or streaming device. Now you can watch the latest PBS episodes or catch up on the shows you missed. And when you support your local station, you can get PBS Passport, giving you access to more episodes, more specials, more of what you love. Arizona had over 100 days of triple-digit weather, making the 2020 summer season the longest we've experienced extreme high temperatures in a row. Cronkite News reporter Melissa Zaremba gives us the latest on how this heat was tough on everyone, including our Valley plants. Hot temperatures during Arizona summers are normal, 
But this summer, the National Weather Service says records were shattered. July and August were the hottest months on record. And that sustained heat was hard on plants, according to Valley landscapers, especially those tall icons of the West Coast. The queen palm that just uh, doesn't take the heat nearly as well as some of the other varieties. With constant extreme high temperatures day after day and no rain made it difficult for these type of palm trees to survive. And what we noticed with the heat was that they did weep over a lot. A lot of the ends burn. You could see uh, burning on the leaves themselves, uh, brown marks, drying edges and so forth. If the fawns are all brown and the stalk is oozing, it may be time to cut the tree's roots. They die from the inside. Once the center is soft or pulls out, the tree itself is dead. The issue could be too much heat, not enough water, too much water, uh, not enough food. All those things can inter be interrelated and affect the health of the tree. To ensure your palms are well taken care of, you want to make sure they're getting plenty of water. Now, a lot of plant owners may think watering plants every day for a few minutes is enough, but that's not the best way. They should only run them once or twice a week, but for many hours at a time. So the plants get a good soaking. That's how they develop a good, strong root system. And, uh, give themselves a better fighting chance during those hot periods. Deborah Thurkill is an ASU program coordinator for Arboretum Services. And you water it, you flood it, and make sure that you can poke your, um, uh, and you can use even a, a long-handled uh, screwdriver, but your soil probe, three feet down, you, you should be able to push it up down uh, to the soil three feet. And, and make sure that the water, it's wet all the way down to three feet, and that's enough water. Thurkill explains even too much water can be harmful to plants. We get a salt buildup in the soil because we're high in calcium, our water is hard water. And that, and when it comes through this long, hot summer, there's also a salt burn when uh, on the roots and that's damaging to the roots. So it's just too much trauma for the plants at the end of a long, hot summer. Melissa Zarimba, Cronkite News. If you're concerned about your palms or other trees, be sure to contact your local nursery or arborist. That's it for Cronkite News tonight. Thanks for joining us. For top Arizona stories anytime, go to cronkitenews.azpbs.org. 2020 has been a stressful year and our mental health may be suffering. We break it down next. So mental health in 2020, it's been, it's been a crazy year. I can't wait to get into this. Let's break it down. Ashley, I've got a ton of questions. I hope we have enough time to get to everything. Um, but I know that everyone watching can probably concede that this has been a tumultuous year. You know, we've seen people really go through things, but I know that there's probably a difference between through things and a mental health issue. So. In this, in this framework, in this world that we're living in in 2020, at what point do you realize or can anyone realize that they may have an issue in the area of mental health? Yeah, oh my gosh. So, so happy to be talking to you also. And yes, this year has been bonkers, um, but really good question. So how do you know if you have a mental illness uh, versus just experiencing the normal stress due to what 2020 brought, right? That's awesome. So basically, if it's prolonged, so if your anxiety or depression is going on, um, at this point, I would say more than a week, we might wanna look into it. Because the thing is, some people have had mental illnesses, they've just been uh, working with them or working through them or using their negative coping skills to get through. But some of these mental illnesses are, are, are like, I'm staying here. <laughs> What's going on, I'm not going anywhere and you can't hide it anymore. Yeah. So, 
kind of a catch-22, but if it's if it's prolonged for more than a week, especially with everything's going on, I definitely go talk to a therapist or go to. The okay, so we are we're in 2020. Are we've been in quarantine? People have been locked into their homes. They have been you know, shut off the world that they've known. And let's say, okay, I've gotten to the point where I'm experiencing something different within myself for over a week. Yeah. How do I, or where do I go for help, for assistance, as we now transition again out of quarantine back to society? It's like changes upon changes. Mm -hmm. Where do I go, sir? Yeah, so once again, awesome question. And I love how you brought up changes. So transitions are huge for human beings, right? One, we love to be comfortable. So I would first ask the person before we go to the point of, you know, do I need a therapist? Do I need a doctor? How well do you usually do a change in general? Mm. Most people never, yeah, most people never <laughs> stop and think about this. But most of the time as humans, we usually don't do well with change. We're used to comfortability. Um, and this could be just a simple reason to go see a therapist too. A therapist can simply just help you navigate through change. But how to do that? Um, I really love Psychology Today. It has a bunch of filters, so you can filter for if you're looking for a certain ethnicity in a therapist, if you're looking for nice. a male or female, if you're looking for insurance type. It also filters through city and your zip code. Does the person do teletherapy? Does the person only do individual? Um, if they're doing only cash pay, do they do sliding scale? So I found that to be Whoa! <laughs> it's a buck! Yeah. <laughs> I found that to be the most effective way at the moment to find a therapist. But you can always call the back of your insurance card and there's specific agents at your insurance company to help you find the therapist that is actually on your insurance panel too. So you can do you it. You know, I love I love that you said therapist, right? Because I, I gotta ask this question because if we gonna break it down, we're gonna break it down, right? <laughs> and, I, and I know this in minority communities, right? Yeah. And and, and, and right now, I right now minorities I think are like one community within the top four that are experiencing extreme mental health issues right now. Absolutely. But in the minority community, what do you say to someone who yeah sees therapy as a faux pas like no we don't do therapy what what would you say to that person especially in this kind of climate so yeah the first question i'll ask them is what would it be like for you to sit with someone who has an unbiased opinion most of the time we go to our friends or we go to our family with our problems right yes. but these people already have years of bias regarding whatever we're talking about you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I say that, and then I say, do you know the therapist has specific techniques to help you? Like, it's not about them talking about if you're crazy or not crazy. It's literally them talking about how you communicate and identify with yourself what's happening and mm -hmm. what would work best for you to move forward. So mm -hmm. believe, I, I, especially when I was new in the field, I got this all the time. You're a therapist, especially in the black community. My family was like, oh, you yeah. know, don't freak me. And I'm like, therapy? Oh, okay. You know, something's really, really <laughs> Whoa, like, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so actually I, I got a little deeper because there's a, a couple more things I need to know. And, and, and I'm sure some other people have this question, but a part of me wants to, I value going to friends and family who kind who know who I am and are able to say, oh, we do know this, we know that about you and can give me advice. So what is the value of going to a therapist who doesn't know you um, to be able to help you through that kind of situation? Absolutely. So if it's a good therapist, no judgment. You know, when you go to your family and your friends, they are gonna judge off of their bias, off of their past wisdom. Not to say they don't have wisdom, I wanna include that, but off of their past wisdom and then off of who you are. A therapist's main goal is to help you facilitate the change that you decide that you wanna make when we together point out, hey, this might be a change that you wanna make. You're experiencing anxiety. Maybe you need to create a routine that doesn't induce anxiety. You know mm. what I mean? Whereas your friend or your family member might just be like, mm, maybe you need to stop drinking so much coffee in the morning. <laughs> so so some people are going back to work. Yes. Um, and they have been on the computer crazy with the kids. <laughs> what yes. do you think that maybe organizations, maybe leaders, supervisors should take into account when employees are coming back? How can they help? In, in, in helping them adjust. 
My biggest thing to leaders, managers, supervisors, know your people and whatever tasks they have to do, create an environment where they can get that task done. So for example, when I had a single mom, I told her from the beginning, you know, look, if, if your kid ever has to be picked up from school or for her, even I was like, if you need to bring him here in the morning and then his dad picks him up, I am more than happy to help facilitate that situation. Mm, meeting people where they are. Exactly. She was a therapist. I need her to be here for our clients, but she can't do that if she's worried about her own son, which mm -hmm. makes sense. Mm. So be sympathetic, be understanding, be knowledgeable about your people and take the stress as much as you can out of what they're doing so they can produce. You know, thank you so much, Ashley. I want to I want to keep going. I still got tons of questions to ask. But I think the main thing here is, you know, even when you're dealing with people in interactions, we hurt people hurt people. And it's, I guess it's, 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 it's really important for us to think about how we're projecting onto other people, how we may contribute to people's mental health. This is awesome. I love it. Listen, guys, it is okay to get therapy if you need it. Drop the taboo. Let's go out there and be our best version of our best selves. Thanks so much, Ashley. I appreciate it. Breaking it down. Yes. This hour of local news is made possible by contributions from the friends of PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. If you have comments about Arizona PBS News, please contact us at one of the addresses on your screen. Thank you. Metallica, the San Francisco Symphony. Two dynamic forces together again for one electrifying concert performance. SM2. Tonight at 8 on Arizona PBS. Revealing conversations with voters. I've seen a lot of nastiness. Will Pennsylvania voters predict again where this election is headed? The working man is getting nothing. Join us for a Washington Week special report. Friday night at 7.30 on Arizona PBS. Arizona PBS deeply appreciates every gift we receive, and we are proud to honor our executive society. These supporters believe in the mission of public television and are making a real impact in our community. If you would like to join the Executive Society, please call the number below or log on to azpbs.org to join. Thank you. When you hear zombie, do you think of shambling, flesh-eating corpses or maybe violent, infected humans? I'm Dr. Emily Zarka, and I'm a monster expert. By diving into the historical creatures we fear, we can learn a lot about ourselves. Friday night at 9 on Arizona PBS. On Masterpiece. So you're saying you're clean? Squeaky. I'm going to nail Peter Lawrence once and for all. Every politician expects to be prime minister. You can get away with anything if you just brazen it out. Hugh Laurie in Roadkill on Masterpiece. Series premiere Sunday night at 8 on Arizona PBS. Explore new ideas and new worlds here on Arizona PBS, a community service of Arizona State University. We are taking back our country's battle for the soul of America. As America faces an historic choice, 